Okay, hello everybody and welcome. Um, I'm so pleased that you're able to join us today for this important session on uh, evidence and COVID-19. Our presenters today will be sharing examples of how evidence has been synthesized to inform programming adaptations to COVID-19, as well as how research methods have been adapted to the COVID context. So I would like to introduce you to our expert panel of presenters. We have here with us um, today, Georgina O'Hare, Head of Impact and Learning for the Family Care First REACT program with Save the Children Cambodia, and Clara Feinstein, Deputy Director of Child Protection for Save the Children. Um, Clara and Georgina will be presenting on a child protection catalog of innovations from COVID-19. We will then hear from Hezia McClelland, Children and Emergency Specialist from Viva, who will be presenting on a program adaptation focused on protecting children over the phone during COVID-19, um, reducing violence at home through evidence-based family mentoring in 30 countries. And last but not least, we have a presentation on the implications of COVID-19 on the drivers of child marriage in emergencies, which will be presented by Alexandra Chaperon and Catherine Gambier. Catherine is a research advisor at the Women's Refugee Commission, and Alex is a senior child protection and emergency specialist for Plan International. Um, we will be sharing videos, and you'll also see in the video Ceres de Leon. Um, Ceres unfortunately was not able to join us today due to the time difference. Um, Ceres is a program specialist at Plan International Philippines, and she'll be um, presenting in the video. So truly an expert panel, and I'm so happy that you're all here to join us today and that Ceres is here in spirit. Um, so that you don't fall asleep, just to give you an overview of the structure of the um, presentation today, we have three presentations which will be shared on video. Um, and then we'll have about 20 minutes for a small group discussion in which you'll be broken up into smaller groups. And then we'll come back into the main room for a Q&A with the presenters. Oh. Did that happen in the last session? I didn't know they were all up. Um, so just a little, a few rules, um, just like in any face-to-face -face training, we encourage you to participate. Of course, um, respect others, particularly in your small groups um, when you're discussing. And we would like to encourage you to keep your cameras on. So um, you can turn them on now or specifically when you're in your smaller groups. Also, you can go to the, um, over your image in the Zoom, there should be three little dots. If you click on that, you can rename yourself. Um, so if you would like to have your name in addition to the agency that you represent or the country that you're um, calling in from, that's just a little simple way to introduce yourselves. Um, and without further ado, I think we have a Mentimeter that I'll stop sharing my screen and hand back over to you, Katrina. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so for everyone, I'm just sending um, a link in the chat there for a Mentimeter. Um, if you don't mind clicking on that link in the chat and in just a moment, I'll share my screen just to get us started with a little icebreaker. Yes, so we'd like to hear from, it looks like we have just over 70 people joining us. So we'd love to hear where you're all calling in from. So if you click on that Mentimeter, it, you'll be prompted with the question and we can see where. So you just type in that code that you'll see up at the top. There we go. Wow. Lots from London, Canada, Rwanda, Europeans, oh, Cambodia, Hong Kong, 
you're up late. Um, and I'm sure that's one of you, Georgina. <laughs> um, oh, wow, great. Okay, so truly a global event. So thank you all very much for joining us. Um, really, we have um, people participating from all over the world, so that's great. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Georgina and Claire, um, and we'll be showing this first video on the catalog of innovations. Presenters, are you okay if I start sharing that right now? Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Apologies, are you seeing the Mentimeter again? It says it had started sharing. Okay, so sorry, give me two seconds here. It's just being a bit of a brat. Following the video, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A after each um, of the presentation. So also feel free as you're watching the video to add your, your questions. Apologies, it should work now. Two seconds. Hello, my name is Claire Feinstein. I'm the Deputy Director of Child Protection at Save the Children. Later in this presentation, you'll meet my colleague Georgina O'Hare. We're going to talk to you about our COVID-19 Child Protection Catalogue of Innovation. As we all know, COVID-19 is creating serious long-term risks to children's protection, well-being and healthy development. On top of this, the pandemic has required significant changes to our ways of working and program implementation, particularly given our focus in child protection on in-person equity and support. As a result, new and creative methodologies for child protection programming continuity as well as adaptations that are effective in ensuring the continuity of essential child protection services and support have become an organizational imperative. In Save the Children, we have an organizational commitment to sharing knowledge, learning from each other, and increasing our impact. We are now using this commitment to help the effective documentation and sharing of learning during the pandemic. This is being done through a global online learning log. Staff members across the organization identify lessons learned. These get discussed by the senior management team in country to ensure senior level buy-in and ownership. The lessons then get uploaded to the global learning log to share what happened, what went well and why, what did not go well or could be improved and why, as well as lessons learned and recommendations. In child protection, we are now leveraging this global learning log to do a deeper dive into these lessons learned with the intention of surfacing innovation. We are identifying areas for follow-up from the global learning log to surface the particular innovation behind the learning. In addition, we are identifying other potential areas of child protection innovation from country response plans. Once lessons learned have been identified, we then do a deep dive and ask additional questions to find out exactly what enabled and hindered the adaptation, its appropriateness and effectiveness in addressing child protection issues and risks, and the evidence that there is for positive outcomes or impact of the adaptation or innovation. From the country response plans, we've mapped a number of areas of innovation which appear to be common across a number of country offices in their programmatic response to COVID-19. These overarching areas are remote adapted case management, parenting without violence, MHPSS, and cash and voucher assistance for child protection outcomes. For the first three areas of work focused on remote or adapted programming, 
This includes adaptations and innovations related to guidance and tools, provision of remote training and support to staff, providing remote or tech-based support to communities, caregivers and children, and messaging through different remote and online platforms. The fourth area of work focuses on increasing use of social protection programming, commonly cash and voucher assistance, to support various child protection outcomes, including violence, family separation, child marriage and child labour. So, as an example, one of the areas of innovation under development at the moment is remote adapted case management and specifically providing remote training and support to staff and other key stakeholders. So far, we have collected examples from Myanmar and Indonesia. As a result of what has gone well, engaging factors, as well as what hasn't gone well and challenges, we have a number of lessons learned for providing case management training remotely. Unsurprisingly, most of these are related to addressing issues of absence and participation, including having manageable numbers, sessions that go for no longer than two hours, ensuring participants know how to use the training platform and strategies to encourage participation online, including having participants use their video, icebreakers, Q&A sessions, case studies and simulations. Providing remote case management training has meant that we have been able to reach more participants at a lower cost. We are currently looking at differences in outcomes in terms of pre and post testing, comparing face-to-face -face and online training modalities. The need to adapt and find new ways of working due to COVID-19 is something we have all needed to do. If others are interested in documenting these lessons learned, adaptations, innovations, we have a few reflections to share. Having the organisational focus on documenting lessons learned and an online platform has certainly helped us and allowed us to leverage an organisational process for our own learning initiative. Having identified common areas of adaptation and innovation and encouraging the submission of lessons learned in these areas will also allow us to have information from multiple examples to develop a specific area of innovation. There have, of course, also been a number of challenges, which has pushed out the time frame for this work. Although using the organisational process and platform has been beneficial, this also means that country offices are developing and documenting lessons learned in all the different thematic areas we work in. So it is taking some time to see an adequate number of child protection submissions. Levels of evidence available on the effectiveness or outcomes of the adaptation also varies and has made it more difficult to be able to say that we have identified an innovation. We were aiming to have this work complete for this meeting and to focus more on the innovations. However, we are now looking at completing it in late October, early November. From there, we will have a focus on sharing these learnings, innovations, both internally and externally, including through facilitating online sharing and learning among country offices and a series of webinars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire and Georgina, for putting that together. Um, if you want to um, add a few comments or if any of you um, who are participating have any questions, we'll take a couple questions before um, the next presentation. Can I just say, um, Selena, A, um, wonderful to be here and to be in this session and to be with the um, everybody, all the participants and the fellow presenters from different organizations and agencies. I think that what we're trying to do here is a, a is an important important segue from the previous session um, and the some of the questions raised about um, interventions and, and and effectiveness of interventions. So what we're really trying to do here is synthesise that evidence and to really you know we presented the global research study in the last session for people who were uh, who participated in that. So we, we know the, the issues that are coming up and the areas of intervention that are needed. We also know from our, our country office response plans that, that MHPSS, adapted MHPSS, adapted case management, adapted parenting um, are really critical um, to our response. So it's now, now we're at the stage of this is happening in countries around the world where we work and how do we synthesize that evidence and what we're really trying to surface here is not just a case study or learning but to find out really what worked what worked and why what didn't work and why 
and then its appropriateness to address specific child protection risks. And then, and, and then to, to measure those outcomes. So it's really like honing in and synthesizing the evidence. And that's what we're trying to, really trying to do here. Thanks. Yes, very important work. And thank you for, for doing this work and for sharing your knowledge and learning with us. Um, Katrina has just posted in the chat a link if you have any questions for for Claire and Georgina, we can also come back um, at the end of all of the presentations for some discussion as well before our small groups. Um, Georgina, Amina, did you there have... is a question in the chat from someone from uh, uh, Amina, in case you missed it. Yeah, I didn't see it. Georgina, do you want to answer this one on the criteria of innovation evidence? Yeah, so interestingly, that's one of the questions that we've put forward for the small group discussion on how we, like what evidence threshold do we need to determine something is an innovation? Uh, so that's actually something we're particularly interested in hearing from everyone. Uh, what we are doing at the moment uh, is that when we receive uh, these adaptations or lessons learned, uh, we are, uh, kind of putting a ranking on them uh, to give an indication of what evidence is available. Uh, so that ranges from anecdotal evidence uh, through to it being based on M&E data uh, and then research. Uh, and so the intention is that that will kind of help inform how we weight the information for when it goes into the catalogue of innovation. Uh, but definitely something... <laughs> anecdotal at this point. Yeah, really great question. You're going to see that come up. So we'd also love to hear from all of you. This is one of our questions actually to you during our small group discussions, which we'll um, um, put together after the presentations. So I think um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Kezia to share your presentation from Viva. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I think we'll start with the video again. Apologies, one second. Hello. Today I'll share with you about Viva's phone mentoring programme, which is supporting children and families around the world during COVID-19. I'll specifically share with you three different ways we've seen impact through the programme, which I hope will help you when you're designing programmes and considering your response. We've seen impact through leveraging the commitment and strength of local communities, through flexible evidence-based materials adapted across contexts, and through simple real-time monitoring, evaluation and learning. In case you don't know who Viva is, a quick introduction, we're an international NGO dedicated to changing more children's lives more effectively. We build and support networks of grassroots churches and organisations to protect and provide for children. We work in 28 countries around the world, with 39 partner networks, connecting over 5,000 local churches and organisations, and reaching more than 4 million children. The phone mentoring programme was developed collaboratively by Viva's global team in response to the emerging realities of COVID-19, where restrictions have made it difficult to carry out the usual face-to-face -face activities and support for children and families, where it's also ever more critical given the rise in violence at home resulting from lockdown. Viva's networks needed to keep reaching children and families and at the same time we all know there have been so many great resources produced during this time to help families but many of these are online and it's not clear that families are easily able to access them especially in the low resource settings where many Viva partner networks operate. One of these resources is the excellent evidence-based parenting tips materials developed by Parenting for Lifelong Health along with others. Viva wanted to find a way to help families and children engage with these meaningfully, where there's sometimes no internet access and no opportunity to meet face to face. So the programme is based on weekly phone calls by a mentor over six weeks with one parent and one child in a family. The sessions are based on the COVID-19 parenting tip materials and Viva's existing work in child protection. The phone calls cover six themes, COVID-19 awareness, building strong relationships within the family, mental health and resilience, staying safe at home, staying safe online, 
learning together every day. Viva has produced a simple conversation guide for each of the themes, for a conversation with the adult in the family and then with the child, following appropriate safeguards and procedures. The conversations help to unpack the topic and can be supported by a follow-up message sent by WhatsApp, sending the relevant parenting tip sheet and again by right to play. The aim is that children and parents will explore these themes together and then as a result of the actions they take each week, build a stronger relationship and reduce the risk of violence at home. Currently, the programme is in process and has reached 12,000 children in 16 countries. We anticipate that it will reach 17,000 children. So, the phone mentoring programme has clearly shown the value of using the strengths and skills of local community workers and parents in trying to keep children safe during COVID-19. They're the most effective resource for keeping children safe during a pandemic, and we should make sure that we make resources accessible to them to enable meaningful engagement and real change for families. So far, the programme has mobilised an estimated 3,750 hours of volunteer time for 220 community organisations and churches and 750 individual mentors. Mentors say that they're finding that these simple conversations help families to gain clarity about good practices and to make specific changes in their behaviour. So far, we've been able to track more than 21,000 specific actions completed by both adults and children following the calls, because mentors ask what families are put into practice each week. One mentor in Nepal said, in the session on COVID-19, families learnt things they didn't know already. They knew already about washing their hands, using sanitizer and wearing masks, but not in detail. And now they know how to apply it practically and more specifically. Another key learning for us is that it works really well to develop a simple, flexible programme that is easy to pick up and use, and also easy to adapt to fit specific context worldwide. In Lebanon, a church-based community project for Syrian refugees had begun the phone mentoring programme just a week or two before the explosion in Beirut. A mentor said, since Lebanon went through the terrifying explosion, this week's topic involved making sure the kids and parents are dealing with the trauma in a healthy way, since such an event can cause them to relive the bad memories from Syria. Parents felt glad to have someone to talk to, and children were able to talk through how they felt as part of the mentoring programme. Similarly, in the Philippines, Viva's partner networks are using the mentoring programme as part of their wider programming, using it as a component in family support to reintegrate children after online sexual exploitation, and adapting it to use in group settings in IDP camps. We've also learned that a simple real-time MEL system can help to pack impact and shape further programme development, and that it's possible to do this even in low-resource settings. After each call, mentors log simple details on an online call log using Kobo Toolkit, which has so far been translated into seven languages. Mentors answer just a few questions each time and also complete an introduction and closing call with the family, asking questions tracking measurable outcomes on child protection, parenting skills and psychosocial well-being. This real-time data shows us the impact of the programme and has also highlighted key issues we need to focus on next, such as supporting access to learning. Collecting this data has enabled us to see some interesting outcomes and impact already. So far, 842 parents have had one-on-one -on -one time with their children. 391 parents have used a new form of positive discipline. And of the 527 families who've completed the programme so far, 173 children have noticed that their parents deal with anger better. 137 children say that there's now less violence at home. And 247 parents say that they enjoy spending time together as a family more. The proportion of children who were able to talk about their problems most of the time or all of the time has increased from 35% to 60%. Mentors say that the family relationships are improving, with one mentor in India sharing, children are now doing some painting and craft or other activities instead of before when they were just sitting at home doing nothing. Many are helping their parents and family relationships are being restored. For more information on the programme or to find out how to use the resources, do get in touch with us in these ways. And I'd like to close with sharing some words from one of our mentors in Syria about how the program has helped parents and children to feel that someone cares about them. And we call them and speak with them, especially they feel like it's not something any in common. Um, any they are caring about us. This this the idea about this program. We are care, yani. and I think uh, we did it. Thank you so much, Kezia, and lovely to hear from one of your colleagues as well. So I'll hand over to you to wrap up. Yeah, I guess it's interesting to go to such a small 
individual example of a program after the big picture. Um, and when I submitted the abstract, I wasn't necessarily seeing it as an evidence um, focus, because it's also about working with families and communities um, and parents. I think it's interesting to take that angle on it and to talk more about that. So I'll be happy to share more about that. Any questions for Kezia? And there's a link there, you can post some of your questions. Um, and we can also come back to that. So thank you again, and um, we'll move on to our last presentation before. Um, so over to you, Catherine and Alex. Thanks, Selena. Um, we'll go ahead and share the video. And then um, as you're listening to the video, please feel free to have um, put your reflections in the chat box and we can answer a few questions once it's finished. Thank you. One is Cesar de Leon from Plan International Philippines. And with me is Catherine Gambier of Women's Refugee Commission, our research partner for this study, which we call Understanding the Drivers of Child Marriage in Emergencies. The research covers three countries, and the first to implement is the Philippines. We'll share more about this experience. So we'd like to begin by sharing a story from an adolescent girl from the province of Maguindanao, and it says, I was in my third year in high school when I stopped schooling because my parents wanted me to marry my cousin. People told me that I'm already married, so I should find livelihood instead. Because we were arranged, we weren't close and wouldn't talk to each other at first. It was hard. I was very young and didn't know how to earn a living. I felt like I was too young when I married. I was ashamed. I married early against my will, but if I did not obey, there would probably be conflict between our families. So this is just one of the stories we have gathered from 2,000 plus respondents, most of whom are girls who may have a similar experience. So please keep that story in mind. And why were we interested in gathering such stories? Let me quickly share the objectives of the research. So the study aims to understand the drivers of child early and forced marriage look at the needs and priorities of girls, and explore adolescent programming in humanitarian settings. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, findings and data evidence will be used to develop a tailored, girl-led, and community-grounded humanitarian program model for child marriage prevention and response. The research took on a participatory mixed methods approach, and one of the methods used was SenseMaker. We will focus on this method as it is new to us. It's very innovative, and we want to share that with you. So SenseMaker is a narrative-based research methodology that allows respondents to give meaning to their stories through responding to a series of pre-identified questions or story prompts. It is administered through a tablet device and encourages a more interactive interface between the enumerator and the respondent. The methodology includes the conduct of a co-design and co-analysis session or workshops with community members and adolescent girls themselves to contribute to the tool development and analysis of findings. So the interview begins with a story prompt, just one question, and this is what we asked. Share a story of what, it, what it's like for young girls and boys to live here in your community or municipality. And based on this question, the respondent will then share a story. Let's look back on the story we read from the earlier slide. Mm -hmm. So imagine that was the response. This will then be followed by a series of questions that will encourage the respondent to further reflect on her initial story. And the follow-up question would be, based on your story, who or what was responsible for what happened? So the story on the left is the same story we had. In the tablet screen, we'll be showing this triangle or triad, and the corners will correspond with three elements. So you will see there myself and the, or the individual, people's mindsets, and people with power and authority. The respondent will be asked to place a bubble or a dot within the triangle based on how strongly she feels each element is reflective of her story. So now a quick exercise. If you were to choose, what would you think would be the response? Based on the story, what or who would you say would be responsible for the circumstances laid out in the story? I'll give you a few seconds to think about your answer. And now I'll show you the actual responses we gathered. The dots represent all the responses, so one dot is one respondent. And we will see here that respondents have actually said 
that it is themselves or the individual who was responsible for what happened in the story. In fact, it was 57% of the respondents. So do you find that interesting or surprising? And what does this say about girls' worldview and how may this affect their life? So this just gives us the idea of the process we've undergone in the SenseMaker data collection. Now, Catherine will share some of the initial emerging themes from the data that we already have. Over to you. Thanks, Iraz. I'm going to discuss some of our emerging findings from SenseMaker in the Philippines, but want to note that this is just a snapshot of the depth and complexity of our emerging findings. First, although the underlying causes of child marriage remain consistent, the contextual drivers differ across provinces, reflecting their diverse populations and nature of the crisis, such as natural, natural hazard, conflict, displacement, or a combination of those. Some of these drivers include controlling adolescent sexuality, which is manifested as preserving family honor, and resolving clan feud and violence. We also explore the differences in child marriage decision-making pathways between love marriages and arranged marriages. And we're learning that families, especially mothers, are involved in marriage decisions. Finally, we learned that there is a sense of duty, both at the individual and community level, as well as at the society level, to marry. We've experienced challenges, as I'm sure many of you have due to COVID-19. In the Philippines, we experienced delays in data collection analysis. In the two other country contexts, Zimbabwe and a third to-be-determined refugee context, we had to push back our study launch dates. We're also adapting to the evolving COVID context. In the Philippines, we're discussing the impact of COVID-19 on child marriage practices during our upcoming co-analysis workshop with community members. For the other country context, we're adding new research questions, such as how has COVID impacted the decision-making pathways within households to enhance or mitigate risk of child marriage? We're also shifting to remote data collection and adapting our research methods as necessary. Findings from these latter studies will help inform the development of child marriage programming in restricted environments that is part of our broader child marriage and emergencies program model. In terms of next steps, we are adapting our research methods and tools to the COVID-19 context. We will complete data collection in two countries by the end of 2021. In spring 2021, we will facilitate co-analysis workshops and or program validation workshops with community members and other key stakeholders in each context. Finally, in fall 2021, we will use the findings from the three studies to finalize and launch the global humanitarian program model for child marriage prevention and response that is tailored, girl-led, and community-grounded. So stay tuned. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, and over to you and Alex, if you have anything to add. Thanks, Selena. Um, and just to say, we're really sorry that Sarez couldn't be on the call today. Uh, she's our brilliant uh, lead of the study in the Philippines. Um, and you know, we're also happy if you have specific questions for her to make sure she can also respond um, offline and share them back um, with the audience. But we're happy to take um, any questions about the study so far, um, what your feelings were like when you saw the, the triad. Um, <laughs> were you surprised by some of the, the answers? Um, yeah, we're, we're happy to take any questions, Catherine. Yeah, thanks. Um, another thing I'd just like to add, um, you know, I, conducting research um, during COVID is extremely challenging. Um, and what has really grounded us in adapting our research methods has been um, that we've been guided by ethical research principles um, to ensure that we're not elevating the risk profile of our community members, especially adolescent girls and our own study staff. Um, so the second study that we've actually just launched um, in Zimbabwe, uh, we 
uh, prior to data collection and, and um, study team training, we developed a risk benefit analysis um, that was implemented by Plan Zimbabwe staff and our research partner um, based in Zimbabwe for each of our research activities. So from enumerator training to data collection and the results from um, this risk benefit analysis then guided any adaptations um, as well as uh, supported us to mitigate any risk that we would um, be facing. Um, so we can we can open up uh, to questions now. Thanks. Yes, if any, anyone has any questions, can you put them in the chat box? Um, and for, I'm having some difficulty with the Menti Q and A, so I can't actually see the questions. That's okay, so Selena. We have a couple in the chat okay, box great. that we could answer. Um, do you, I'll, I can take the first one, uh, Catherine, and you can take the methodology adaptation question. Sure. Um, so yes, we did translate um, the questions. What was challenging was the SenseMaker tablet can only be translated into languages that are registered in a global database. And I can't quite remember exactly what it's called. So unfortunately, we could only translate it into Tagalog, but um, we did have separate translations into local dialects. So the um, enumerators were able to uh, translate directly when they were collecting data on the tablet. So even if the tablet didn't have the local translation that was still provided by um, the facilitator uh, of the device. And what's great about the use of SenseMaker is that it, it takes a bit of this um, analysis bias out of the process. And so, um, you know, participants themselves are really um, coding their own responses for you. So they're telling you exactly, you know, what the implications of this story uh, means for them. So um, we get a lot of really powerful information from that process. Thanks, Alex. Um, a question from Huda. Um, how did you adapt your methodology to reach out to girls? Um, so since our data collection has been completed in our first uh, country site in the Philippines, we're now uh, planning for our co-analysis workshop with community members, including adolescent girls. Um, so our plans are, um, if we're not able to reach adolescent girls and hold an in-person workshop, of course, with all COVID um, precautions and mitigations, um, then we would tap into um, Plan Philippines um, existing network of um, adolescent programming where they're engaging adolescent girls um, virtually to ensure that we get um, feedback um, on the data and also engage them in the, um, in the program design. I could just take one more question, Selena, and then we can move on. I'm not sure how we're going to Yeah, great. Yeah, okay. maybe one more question. I see one. Yeah, there's one just left in the chat. Um, how is this to be adapted in humanitarian context affected by internal conflict and violence? So um, the context in Mindanao is actually uh, internal conflict. There was a displacement um, in Marawi City. So that, and it was due to um, violent activities between the government and, and a local armed group. So this is definitely, um, the methodology has been you know, adapted to a context like this. And so we were able to access IDP communities uh, living both in evacuation centers and um, in host communities. And then also ensuring that we spoke to um, host community participants as well. Catherine, do you want to add anything to that? Um, um, just to add that, so we implemented this research in four different provinces um, um, in, in the Philippines. And as Alex mentioned, that there was internal conflict. Um, you may remember in the news in 2017 regarding the Marawi um, conflict or siege um, crisis. So we're working um, not only with um, an IDP uh, populations and communities, um, but in the other provinces, there's also some intermittent conflict. And what was really interesting from um, our emerging research um, findings is that the drivers seem to be very different, um, even depending on the, the type of conflict and the type of violence and displacement experienced by community members. Thank you, and thanks very much for those questions. 
Um, I think now we'll break into smaller groups. So Katrina has posted our questions in the chat box there. So you'll have access to those when you are moved into smaller groups. Um, so we would encourage you to turn your videos on. Um, we'll have about 20 minutes for a discussion in the smaller groups and um, all of the presenters will be popping around um, to the smaller breakout rooms and then we'll come back um, to discuss all together for about um, the last 20 minutes. Also, I'll, I'll work out, I know some of you have posted questions in Mentimeter, so I'll try to pull those up so we can address those when we come back as well. Um, so um, I will, Katrina, if you can put us all in, when we all come back, you'll have about a minute warning or two minute warning. So you can stay in your breakout rooms until that is up and then you will all be pulled back into this main room. Um, so thanks again to all the presenters and we'll now break for the smaller group discussions. Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you enjoyed your discussions. Um, just a note to the presenters, you have now received a link with the questions that were posted earlier. Um, so I don't know if any of you want to start off with some reflections. We also, um, Katrina will be putting in the chat box um, two jam Jamboard links. Katrina, correct me if anything, if I'm saying anything incorrect. Yeah, so we yeah. would like to um, ask you, <clears throat> Um, to post one or two reflections, one, of, one or two of your key takeaways from your discussions and your groups on the Jamboards. Um, if you would like to do that, if not, you can also feel free to just type it into the chat or any other questions that you have. We'll have about um, 20 minutes now for discussion um, with the presenters. Perfect. And just to be very clear, it will actually be the same link that I sent you before, but you just have to scroll down below the breakout rooms and you'll see there'll be one Jamboard per question where you do the exact same thing and just write your one key takeaway from your group. Thank you. So I saw in the Mentimeter Q&A, there was a few questions that were all linked to what Amina had posted. Um, which was our question for you as well, related to how we define innovation. And um, I'm just wondering if, if anyone would like to share some of the takeaways or reflections from the discussions that you had. Or any of the presenters. Yeah, I suppose I can present on what we talked about in, in group five. Uh, I mean, basically it was, we started off with actually needing to define what innovation is, uh, which I know is something that we've struggled with as well. Uh, and we need to do that before we can really talk about what evidence base uh, is needed uh, to say if something is an innovation or not. Um, we also talked about uh, kind of the difficulties at the moment with saying something is uh, maybe not innovation, but a, a good practice, uh, because there hasn't been the time to test things. Uh, it may be too early uh, for there to be enough evidence yet, uh, which is definitely something that we're finding in our work. Uh, and also there is this constantly changing environment and we constantly need to adapt. So it's also being able to kind of build this evidence in such a, an environment in flux, perhaps. Um, so really just lots of kind of issues and difficulties uh, with doing this. But we did also talk about uh, some adaptations that were happening around case management and community-based mechanisms uh, and kind of children and youth participation. Um, which is kind of what we talked about in our presentation as well. Can I, thanks Georgie, can I just add um, from group three, and I don't know whether somebody from group three, I know that Claire was, was producing a nice jam board for us, but I think some of the things that we looked at was, um, you know, to build that evidence, what has been important is the pre-COVID um, uh, 
the, the existing relationships, the existing trust in communities um, and among partners, and then the existing methods. So people are already familiar that we've got that we've built up the relationships, we've built the trust in the communities. And then, especially if you're trying to work with children and young people, if they're working with methodologies they already know and then you you have you find how to adapt them online offline because offline is also very very important and that's what we um that's what we were thinking that the, those existing um relationships the existing trust and the existing methods and then that importance of offline you know the door-to-door -door, the home-to-home -home, because lots of the people we work with and especially if you're talking about girls and women not having access to the, the mobile and the online technology. Um, I don't know whether anyone else wants to um, respond from group three, thanks. Any other reflections from other presenters in the groups that you were in? It looks like a lot of the groups were discussing this. Anyone discussing anything different? Hi, this is Sandra. We were in uh, group two and we talked more about the process, how to select the best approach and then how to go back and forth trying different things. And, and I think that was, uh, that was interesting to hear about the process and how, you know, how much time it took and how also people felt like it was not necessarily the priority for most of the the country and the team on the ground we were working with, like when you're in the middle of a pandemic, like collecting data is not necessarily seen as the number one priority. So trying to cope with that and, and, and think through all those uh, challenges, I think that was very interesting to hear from, uh, from people who were conducting the research. Did anyone have any ex other examples um, of adapting research methodologies um, to work with communities that they would like to share from your own programming experiences? Um, we had a question that was related to um, Save the Children, how other agencies could also um, add to the the catalog is there. Okay, great. Opportunity. <laughs> um, so, so we are in the middle of producing this, and and you know, as Georgina explained in the video, we're looking at remote case management, we're looking at remote parenting, and we're looking at um, remote adapted MHPSS, the so remote adapted slash adapted, and then we're also looking at cash and child protection. So those are the four pre-identified interventions. Um, that we've, you know, based on the what's happening in our country programs and the work that we're doing, and so that gives us focus as well for a guide. So do contact us if you if you're working um, on on any of these, and I, I presume a lot of you are. Then do contact us. I mean, we're at the moment we're doing the documentation, we're developing the the um, the catalogue, um, and we will we do want to share it, and we do want to, you know. Um, and keep it you know as a live document so great and um, if people and if you're working with save the children in country um you know let us know and then we can we can make those links up link up as well so now that sounds exciting georgina yeah i agree it sounds great i suppose the the process itself that we have in the learning log is internal to save the children so people wouldn't be able to externally access it to upload a learning uh, but I think, yeah, contact Claire and she'll do something about it. <laughs> great. We also have another um, great question. So what are globally common approaches to improve community involvement in child protection? Um, thinking about the role that community can play in promoting and protecting um, children. Any reflections from presenters? Can you just repeat it, Selena? Um, what are globally common approaches to improve community involvement? Um, so I am based on the subject of this, I'm assuming it's related to um, synthesizing evidence or research. 
um, adapting research methods. Could it be in response to Kezia's presentation? Could with like be. the community volunteers and the facilitators? Yeah, I don't know if it's globally common, but <laughs> um, yeah, we found it works. I think an advantage of the approach is that we're working with community mentors who are already kind of involved in those families' lives. Um, and so when they're starting that mentoring relationship with the child and the family, they can be very um, clear on the consent and whether people want to take part and also gathering the data is much more of a part of the process of a program delivery. So I think there's a good balance there where we can learn from that. But there's a clear, clear consent from the child and the family and clear benefit to them of taking part. Um, but yeah, I think an interesting question for us is how we then link what we're learning with people that want to find out more about the situation. And so, Can I add, yeah. Selena, from some of our experiences with the child marriage research in the Philippines, um, we, we initially went into the process believing that um, we could just ask about child marriage. And maybe to some of you, you think uh, I'm very naive, but I think we felt like, okay, we can have an open conversation with families about this. And when we had our first um, consultation with community members to really co-design uh, the questions and um, like the process that we would go through with some of our participatory activities, uh, we were told very strongly that this is not a subject that you can just walk into uh, a community and talk about. And so I think having that, that pushback and being told, you know, your questions need to be broader, you know, allowing people to talk about um, child marriage more organically, like more naturally, um, and then taking those other indicators and that will help you understand like what, what leads to a decision to marry um, will help you. So I think that was really important. And I think something that needs to be really integrated into all of our processes when we are collecting data. Um, is getting that community feedback from, from the very beginning. Thanks, Alex. And um, also just to add, and you know, our overall approach is to ensure that this research, um, it, we're involving community members, including adolescent girls themselves, um, not only from, from the design of, of our um, research tools, such as what Alex was just describing, providing input on our some of our research questions, um, but also that we're then bringing um, back the data itself to community members. Um, so we have sort of an advantage in this um, COVID-19 um, process um, in this way because our research design, um, in we had intentionally planned to go back to community members to share the data with them and co-design this program model informed by the data. Um, and although the majority of our data was collected um, before COVID-19, we now have an opportunity since you know, COVID-19 has um, impacted communities to then you know, share back the data, but then also to explore how this data um, you know, may be adapted and um, shifted to um, help inform the program model that's addressing the immediate needs of um, communities and how it's, you know, how, how COVID-19 has impacted um, communities and um, then how we need to, um, you know, further adapt the program model because of it. Thanks for that. Two really important points, just thinking about contextualizing um, community understandings whatever issue it is we're working on and, and also our accountability to communities and sharing um, our findings and um, with them. So um, we just have a, a few more minutes. Um, I just see a, a question related to what was the most innovated intervention? Claire, you responded, but maybe it would be good just um, to. Um, um, Patricia, yes. Um... Yes, we're, it's yet to be determined um, as we develop the catalogue and, and you know, we're, 
we're really working on it now, but you know, just from seeing what's on the organizational learning log, the online learning log, there's, there's amazing adaptations going on. So now we're, we're following them through and really trying to surface that um, innovation and find out really what works. And, 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 and so as soon as we know, um, as I said, we, we will be able to share this catalog and share it externally and, you know, whether we share it through webinars or, or however we share it and, and we'll be able to let you know the answer to that um, as soon as we can. Thank you very much. I think we're all looking forward to that. Are there any final reflections from any of the, uh, the participants or the, the presenters as we wrap up? Selena, this is Alex again. I, I just wanted to share um, an interesting group discussion that we had uh, in a group that I participated in, which was, um, you know, exciting because Claire and, and Georgina's presentation on the innovations gets us all thinking about like, oh, what's working well. Um, but then what was also brought up into my group was um, we should make an effort also to capture the things that, that failed or that didn't go well. Um, and I think that could be an interesting piece to take back to the assessment, measurement, and evidence working group. Actually, is to start looking at collecting, um, you know, what what kind of approaches don't really work in an infectious disease setting. Um, what like what are the recommendations when it comes to making adaptations to data collection in this time? Because now we maybe have some insight into. Um, what completely doesn't work or what comes with a lot of risk um, and that we don't want to recommend. So I think um, that could be an interesting take on today's uh, discussion as well. And thanks, I Alex. Can, can I just, thanks Alexandra. And that's what the catalog is trying to do is those, those two things. So what works well and why, what doesn't work and why it's not working. So we're trying to, to look across what we're doing and say, um, uh, look, at, look at both things. And I do think that that is, me as well. It's a really important take from today's afternoon so far. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a really important um, point, Alex. And um, maybe just to highlight that I think we're often um, use indicators which show our progress. And, you know, indicators are really to show what works and what doesn't work. And we shouldn't be afraid to, to try something and um, communicate that it hasn't worked. And maybe just to highlight on this note too, just generally speaking, um, in the CPMS indicator table, there is an indicator, one or two indicators that, um, that you could modify that seek to measure uh, um, also any unintended consequences, which should we, we should be doing just broadly speaking, but particularly as we move through the COVID context and are adapting our programming. So please do turn to the CPMS indicator and um, I can't remember which indicator it is, but you'll find it in there. A really good point. Kezia, did you have your hand up? No? So I think um, we'll wrap up. So I just wanna thank you all very much for participating. This has been a really interesting um, session and uh, really great to hear all the work you're doing and thanks so much for to all the presenters for sharing your learning and your knowledge um, and stay tuned everybody for more information um, from the presenters. Um, we do have one last Mentimeter question um, that you're welcome to fill out. We're just interested to hear what your key takeaway is from this session um, and just also, as we're moving on, um, just so you know, next steps for the next session. Um, so um, when you leave this session, we'll have a 10 minute break, um, which will allow you time just to step away from your screens. And then you can go back um, into the main Zoom room and click on the next session you would like to join. Um, and you can do that before your break um, because they will max out at I think 100 people each. Um, so as you're just uh, filling out the Mentimeters, thanks again to all of you for participating and to the presenters. Um, and I also just wanted to encourage you um, on the topic of the Child Protection Minimum Standards that this is the one year anniversary for the revised CPMS. 
Um, so um, the standards, of course, are, are extremely important um, because they provide a global understanding um, of, of child protection. And please, um, if you don't have a hard copy, you can look up the CPMS on the Alliance website. And now I'm gonna switch back and look at some of your responses. Um, great. Okay, so yes, documenting the learning, community perspectives, um, community participation, get curious about innovation. I think um, perhaps, I think, you know, we tend to replicate the same activities over and over again in child protection and, and perhaps with this current context, it is an opportunity to think outside the box a little bit and, and think about how we can adapt our programming. Um, and yes, encourage you all to share um, any learning that your own agencies are um, documenting in your own programming adaptations at the interagency level so we can all learn um, from each other. So we're a little bit a little bit early, but um, any final questions we'll we'll stick around for the chat. Um, but if not, I wish you all a good afternoon and evening and hope you all enjoy the rest of the annual meeting these next couple of days. <laughs>